Over to you, Peggy. Thanks, Catherine, and hello, everyone. Um, so we're going to talk about crowding, and just to start it, I'd like a, just a, a little experiment. Could I ask everyone who is able to, to switch on their video for me? Just give you a moment to do that. So we've got uh, 70 participants, so maybe 60 clinical leads in the room. Um, uh, show of hands, who is experiencing crowding uh, as a returning phenomenon uh, in the room at the moment? And if we can scan up and down, I'm thinking that on the straw poll, it looks like it's pretty almost universal, isn't it? So it's hard to see if I'm on the screen share. So um, this is a real problem that we, uh, we do need to worry about. Thank you, guys. Um, so uh, we've, we've been worrying about a return to crowding really ever since we saw it disappear. Uh, back at the start of the COVID um, uh, crisis and uh, you'll be aware at that time we released um, a document called Resetting Emergency Care which was really in response to our concerns that although we were having a temporary reprieve, uh, crowding would return. Um, there's two things to think about there. One is that, that that episode proved that crowding isn't mandatory, you can operate in an uncrowded environment and for many of us, it proved how wonderful emergency medicine can be when you operate in an uncrowded environment. Um, but now, of course, uh, it's returning, um, uh, as we've just seen. So what, what can we do about it at this stage? So next slide, please, Catherine. So from a point of uh, Arkem, uh, we're anxious that uh, we're not perceived as being a one-trick pony on this. And Arkem is, is doing a... Uh, a, a significant amount around crowding still. You'll be aware of the Arkem Cares campaign, which Adrian is currently refreshing in light of uh, COVID, but which is still entirely valid. Um, we have been in regular consultation with policymakers. Uh, we've been thinking hard about how it applies in the COVID era and trying to uh, advocate, and we think pretty successfully um, in this regard. Um, the Winterflow project is restarting and we've continued to engage with things like the clinical review standards and, and other policy initiatives um, and supporting uh, individual departments as well. So there's quite a lot of work going on at Arkem around this and we're anxious that, that the uh, debate isn't, isn't um, taken over solely about concerns or uh, worries about things like uh, 111 and the clinical review of standards because we all know there is so much more to crowding than that and to tackle this problem uh, you need to think of it in the round. Thank you Catherine, next one. So I guess the question is uh, for us as, as clinical leaders uh, what can what can we be doing, what can you as clinical leaders be doing if your department is becoming crowded and we know we're in a different world so crowding was completely unacceptable, toxic, horrible phenomenon before uh, COVID came to visit us. And now COVID is with us, the risks are even higher. We cannot uh, any longer uh, expose patients, many of whom are vulnerable and elderly, to the risk of hospital acquired infection. And we cannot expose staff to these risks either. Um, and our, our worry is that for a time that seemed, it seemed that there was some light at the end of the tunnel here, but um, I think many of us are wondering if we're going back to the future. We're seeing uh, a lot of the support and, and, and improvements that occurred during the COVID period, uh, perhaps uh, looking like they might be retrenching, redeployed staff are, are going back. Up. Um, and we're, we're aware, I think all of us, that our staff are tired and as leaders, we are tired too. Uh, we mustn't underestimate um, how hard, how hard work this has all been, uh, both in our personal lives and uh, the, the constant change and then change upon change. And there are, as Cliff has indicated, as we've just seen some worrying signs about what's gonna happen in winter. However, there is some opportunity here for positive change. And I think, although we're all knackered, um, I think we, we equally, we must, uh, we can't give up and roll over. Well, we can, but it's, it's, it's probably not the right thing to be doing at the moment. We need to keep uh, plugging away at this awful problem and uh, and I guess that's the first thing to say is um, uh, that for us as leaders is something uh, I think we still have to do. So we've released um, some guidance which here, there's a link, I put it out on the Clinical Leaders website uh, uh, giving some suggestions about uh, how to approach this. Um, I've, I've put together some highlights for this presentation so if we go on to the next slide. 
So first thing really as leaders is, uh, is advocacy. Um, this is some, somewhat disappointing really. Uh, on one level, crowding isn't rocket science. We, we all know that um, uh, if our departments, if we have the right staff, the right space and flow, we basically know how to do our jobs and can run uh, excellent emergency departments. And I think once again, COVID showed that if nothing else. Um, that when our, when our departments are flowing freely and we've got the right tools to do our job, we know how to do our job. So it's not rocket science, but it's a very difficult, complicated, complex problem to solve. And disappointingly, there still seems to be a need for advocacy. And the, the need for this is, is probably inversely related to the effectiveness of uh, senior leadership. So we know that engaged um, senior leaders who understand the problem uh, will be advocating, uh, if you like, on the behalf of the emergency department and its patients, because they, those, those patients are regarded as patients of the whole organisation or of the whole system and not just of the ED. Um, our ab Forgive me for the phone in the background. Um, I think if, if advocacy is needed, it is a bit disappointing, but um, we've suggested some ways to focus on it. And the document has been deliberately written so that it can be shared with senior leaders within your organization and within your system uh, and there are some uh, if you like some meta messages buried within the section on advocacy so um, uh, there is still uh, you know a, a clear case based on patient and staff experience and safety that is absolutely undeniable and even more critical now there are some ethical and legal frameworks which support the fact that crowding uh, should not be allowed to happen. Importantly, I think there's, uh, and this, this, this may become important, there's, there is a need to respect emergency department patients and staff. So it's not acceptable um, for us as a speciality to be the only speciality where IPC measures may not be seen uh, to apply. So, uh, if, if we, for instance, are, are facing crowded emergency departments or the, the threat of crowded emergency departments because we are trying really hard to protect patients and staff within the hospital, it's not acceptable to expose our patients and staff to exactly the same risk that we are trying to protect other people from. Our, our patients and our staff aren't in any way different from other patients and staff in that respect. And then finally, um, the message that uh, we're always going to be there to provide a safety net for patients, but we, we, we really can't continue, continue to be the safety net for the whole system is an important one to, uh, for, us to be, for us to be pushing. Um, th there's no doubt that uh, emergency departments are better at some things than others and that uh, we are better focusing our skills on uh, particular patient groups and that other patients will get a, a better service if they can access those services elsewhere. Now, um, uh, we've heard a lot about that today and I don't propose to dwell on that any further. Uh, next slide, please, Catherine. Uh, so, um, uh, next question to ask ourselves is, have, have our EDs adopted relevant good practice? Uh, and again, we've outlined these, but you'll notice this is a relatively short section within this document because uh, we don't want to continue to propagate the myth that ED crowding is all about the ED. Um, however, it really is important that we get our uh, collective acts together in our departments, not least because it's very hard to get traction elsewhere if, uh, if um, the eye of SARM continues to revert to the emergency department and look at what we are perceived to be doing badly. Um, so doing our, doing our bit to get our IPC and COVID adaptations where they need to be, uh, to look at our staff space and processes and optimize them and importantly make the cases where there is a need for for change or increased resources um, that's very important um, you'll notice the document also says that it's not just enough for us to be making the cases those cases need to be supported appropriately within organizations and then uh, the final thing is um, uh, on the key points is consistent messaging uh, from uh, senior clinicians it's very important that we in our departments present a united front within our organizations um, and that uh, managers colleagues um, whoever we are talking to and whoever we are trying to influence when we get the opportunity is getting the same message uh, from the team and then finally uh, i think hopefully we're all there but we need to work out what our safe capacity is this uh, winter 
um, because a lot depends on that and a lot of escalation depends on that. There's more to it, it's all in the guidance. Those are the key points perhaps. Next slide please, Catherine. Um, next up is what can the system and organisation be doing? Uh, and here you'll find an extensive uh, set of suggestions. It, it's not comprehensive by any means, um, uh, but perhaps some of the key things are, we, we all know that exit block trumps everything. Um, uh, I've used the sink as an analogy here. Um, if, if the drain from the sink is blocked, uh, the tap can be on full and the sink will fill up quickly. We can build a bigger sink, it'll just take longer to fill it up, but it will fill up. And if the tap is just dripping, it'll fill up slower, but it will still fill up. So exit block trumps everything. And I think we all know that, but uh, we still need to look at the problem in the round. Uh, so we do still need to look at whether there are alternatives to ED, which may be better for patients. And uh, that ED shouldn't be the default option of many pathways. And similarly, things like SDEC are really important for us to look at. Can we uh, find alternatives to admission? Uh, are there better things? Because generally those are better for patients and they're better for um, the system as well. Uh, we all know about bed occupancy within hospitals. They need to be staffed beds. Uh, just opening beds doesn't work if there aren't nurses to look after the patients and uh, teams of uh, inpatient uh, doctors uh, to look after them. And there are specific improvements we can make around general medical pathways and, and advocate for around speciality engagement. You'll find in the guidance a really long list, which I'm hoping will be useful as a kind of checklist to go through uh, with senior managers and system leaders to say, have we looked at this? Where are we with this? And I put in, in red at the bottom there, extended hours 7-7. I think one of the big problems we, we do face is that hospitals still in most cases, I think it's probably fair to say, work to a traditional nine to five, or if you're lucky, eight till six sort of schedule. Don't necessarily work particularly well at the weekends, don't work necessarily well at uh, bank holidays, and don't work in the evenings. And that is one of the causes of crowding. And I think it's, it's important that we advocate that any alternatives are accessible and they work extended hours and throughout the week because we all know that if they don't um, it adds to the problems. Uh, next one please Catherine. One point on this I think it is it, some of this is a little bit scary and a little bit of a leap into the unknown so um, there's a lot of scepticism for instance around the impact that uh, changes to the 111 system may make um, there, there's uh, potential concerns about redirection, there's potential um, uh, scepticism around the impact of SDEC. Um, these, these concerns may or, not be, may or may not be valid, but we need to be careful that um, we don't let throw babies out with bathwater if we hit bumps in the road, because really, um, this is a phrase Simon Carley coined um about all this we're, we're we're undertaking with a lot of this stuff the mother of all quips or the mothers of all quips and a lot of this is a journey into the unknown but what we do know for certain is that um the definition of um insanity is is doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results and we have to we have to uh, engage with things that are trying to make improvements and make the best of them and stick with it, find ways around it. I think Vaz's presentation is a good example of how um, they've worked their way around problems, sought improvements and not let things get de derailed at the first hurdle. And I think for us as, as leaders, it's important to be in that space uh, to, to be providing encouragement uh, for our teams. Thank you, Catherine. Next one, please. Um, the second bit, uh, once you've worked your way through that enormous list of uh, stuff that other parts of the system can be doing to help crowding, uh, is to think about escalation. Um, the, the picture of the tumbleweed uh, is, is a caution against tumbleweed escalation. I thought we all know that, where we pick up the phone, say, look, things are really bad in the ED. A manager says, yes, I can see they're really bad. I'll do stuff. And um, then we, we spend the next hour or two wondering what has changed and what has happened. And all we can really see is tumbleweed blowing down the corridors. Um, and our departments are still struggling. So it's, it's worth looking at our escalation, making sure that they're up to date with the new COVID capacity and triggers, that they work 24 hours a day, seven days a week, can bring in staff when needed, and don't just involve the hospital. 
And um, most importantly, I think, is that the most difficult question of all, and this is the key question many of us are facing now, is what do we do when our ED is full and we are holding ambulances? Because we know that crowding is unacceptable and we know that holding ambulances is very bad. And we end up caught between a rock and a hard place. Um, now, our college's position on this is that probably the least worst option out of holding ambulances, crowding a department, uh, cohorting before ED or cohorting after ED, which are some of the options, if the system isn't working and you can't just admit patients where they need to be, is post-ED cohorting. And that that should not be the responsibility of our speciality or of the staff for the emergency department, because they've got their hands full running emergency departments. And I guess one of the key questions for us is, uh, and this is a phrase from Catherine, is there a big red button we can press that says, we are holding ambulances, what is this organisation going to do about it? And in the, in the newsletter, we're, we're all being encouraged to make an almighty fuss when we're holding ambulances, because that cannot be right either. So we need to look at our processes and we need to look at escalation and, and start making noises about this is not good enough. Crowding is not good enough and holding ambulances is not good enough either. Finally, um, uh, it may be that we find ourselves in this position this winter. So we're, we're doing all we can um, and we're finding that we have concerns and we feel the need to escalate them. There's a little bit of advice about what to do that in this about that in this document. Um, uh, basically, the, the sequence should be we should exhaust our internal processes first, and the safety netting refers to internal safety netting, so things like whistleblowing procedures or other procedures you might have in your hospital if you don't think you're getting what you need. And then there are a number of suggestions about uh, regulatory authorities and their role. Uh, our professional duty, uh, we have one to report safety concerns. And then finally, as, uh, as college, we're always ready to offer an advice and support um, through either your uh, regional reps, uh, any of the VPs, or um, uh, through Catherine. So we're, we're always happy to discuss things. Um, so there's the guidance. Uh, we're, we're really hopeful that this is useful for us in the real world, on the ground, given what we are facing. Um, uh, whilst we continue to do all the advocacy we need to. Um, I'd appreciate feedback about how effective it is, whether it works for you so that we can improve it further. Um, and that is me done.